check, 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 check. Here we go, Cubby. Here we go. Do you remember Jody Davis of the Cubs? Harry Carey would sing Jody, Jody Davis, King of Wrigley Field. No? Well, fine. Do that way. Okay, here we go. We talked about oxygen transport. Say, yeah. Right? One of the ways oxygen is transported in the blood is how? Right, bound to the iron on hemoglobin. You better write bound to the iron on hemoglobin. And Fe plus 2 is iron for you non-chemistry people. What's the best way to transport oxygen? Bound to the iron on hemoglobin. 98% of all the oxygen is transported that way. So if you're bleeding your own blood, you're not going to be able to transport as much oxygen because you are bleeding your own blood. The other way is dissolved in the plasma. And we learned about that, didn't we? Right? Dissolved in the plasma. And how is that measured? How is it measured? I see no one spent any time at all on the respiratory system. I get it. You got the midterm coming up, right? You got to you got to fight those battles when they come up. I'm with you. Wait, I'm drawn. PO2, partial pressure of oxygen. Say yeah. How much percent is dissolved in plasma? How did you figure that out? Okay. Say yeah. All right. Here we go. What's a byproduct of metabolism you got to get rid of or it's bad for you? CO2. CO2. Where's CO2 highly concentrated? How did you know that? Because I wrote cell and then put CO2 in there. Okay. Where does it want to go? Into the blood. Bam. One of the ways that carbon dioxide is transported is dissolved in the plasma. Say yes. How is it measured? PCO2. Tell me you got that. What's this? That's a red blood cell. Why? It has a cell membrane and it's red. What's the protein inside a red blood cell? Hemoglobin. What's it better than a hemoglobin? Iron. Say yeah. The hemoglobin molecule has this. Whoever gets this will get extra credit right now. What is this? And that's an end. Yeah, that's a bad end. You're making stuff up over there. Does anybody? Come on. No. Huh? Um, aminogen. <laughs> aminogen? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm going to have to tell you. It's called the amino group. Right? I told you this. The amino group opened up for Menudo at Summerfest. Do you remember that? They sang slow motion. I like it like that. Here we go. Watch it. It's embedded in the hemoglobin. And carbon dioxide binds to the amino group on hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide and oxygen do not compete for the iron. 
The only thing that binds to the iron is oxygen. Where does carbon dioxide bind in hemoglobin? Right, and you're going to tell me the amino group. Say yeah. And it's called carboxy hemoglobin. Or just Diddy. You got me? The final way is dissolved in the plasma as this guy. Immediate extra credit, 20 points on respiratory cardio or respiratory digestion. Yeah, that's nice. Latyra, boom. Anybody? It's this is bicarbonate. What's this? Yeah, Latyra, boom, plus twenty. That's how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. Say yaba, guys. No, carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate. The chemistry of that will come in advance. All you need to know is there are three ways carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. Dissolved in the plasma as PCO2, bound to the amino group on hemoglobin, and transported in the plasma as a bicarbonate ion. Say yeah. Guys? Who's with me? Carboxyhemoglobin. If anyone's willing to change their name legally to carboxyhemoglobin, I will guarantee them at least a B minus in this class. Carboxyhemoglobin. Anybody? Carboxyhemoglobin. That's not a bad name. Okay, here we go. Ready? Ready? Who's ready? Okay, watch. Watch. You guys ready? That's okay. What are the byproducts of metabolism? CO2, heat, ADP, hydrogen ions. Say yeah. Okay, and what's uh, the other one? Lack of oxygen. What's the word to describe lack of oxygen? No oxygen. Good. Ooh, that's close. Hypoxia. Better write that down. Hypoxia. Who's writing that down? Anybody willing to get a tattoo of hypoxia? Watch. What do these do to arteries that are supplying these metabolically active cells? It causes those arteries to dilate. What is hemoglobin? It's a protein. And we learned, and I'll never forget it. It was definitely a Wednesday. That proteins are temperature and pH sensitive. Ain't that right? Here we go. Want this whole thing. I drew this while Evelyn was bothering me. <laughs> Who's with me? Now watch. Where do you want to send the greatest amount of oxygenated blood? No. What part of the body? The most metabolically active cells of the body. Say yes. Where do you want oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin? Where do you want that to happen? I'll give you a hint. In the lungs. Say yeah. Where do you want that oxygen to let go of the hemoglobin? I'll give you another hint. The cell. Say yes. 
What are the byproducts of metabolism? ADP, CO2, heat, hydrogen ions. Say yes. What's hemoglobin? It is a protein. And you know that it is temperature and pH sensitive. Ain't that right? So here we go. What I'm going to do in this class is I'm just going to tell you this. Now, I want this whole thing. And you're going to get it. I sound like a parent. You do that again, you're going to get it. Do you like the larger font of the pen? It looks kind of remedial. Make sure you stay in the lines, kids. Watch. What's this? Yeah, that's a red blood cell. I'm going to make some good hemoglobin. That's as good as it gets. What's embedded in the hemoglobin? Where's oxygen highly concentrated? Wait, going to give you a hint. No, that ain't a cell. Yeah, in the alveoli. So what's this? A pulmonary capillary. Say yeah. So in the lungs, oxygen will bind to the iron on hemoglobin. Say yes. Where does all this newly oxygenated blood now go to? What part of the heart? My name is? The left side of the heart. Watch it. Look at this drawing. Look at it. Right. You had the venous blood here? Say yeah. Guys, that venous blood now is going to go to the lungs. What's going to happen to that blood? It's going to get oxygenated. And all that newly oxygenated blood with the oxygen bound to the iron hemoglobin is going to come back to the left side of the heart. Where is the left side of the heart going to send the vast majority of that oxygenated blood? What cells? The most metabolically active cells of the body. Say yes, because arterial blood, we learned, always takes the path of least resistance. Say yes. So watch it. Watch it. So now you have a systemic capillary and a cell. What's that cell producing? That cell's producing carbon dioxide, heat, ADP, hydrogen ions. If the hydrogen ions build up in the blood, what's going to happen to the pH? It's going to drop. What's hemoglobin? It's a protein. That's right. You just stole my thunder, and I worked so hard to get this right. So the oxygen bound to the iron on hemoglobin, when it gets close to the metabolically active parts of the body, that hemoglobin is going to heat up and the local pH is going to drop. And that's going to change the shape of hemoglobin. And oxygen will no longer be able to bind to the iron. The iron will let it go. And where is it going to go and why? From why, why? Boom. Say yes. Say yes. Watch it. We ain't done yet. Where do all the veins of the body dump their venous blood? How many people had a cup of coffee today? How many people thought your coffee was too hot? And Papa Bear's was too cold? Watch. If your coffee's too hot, what can you do besides blow on it? You can put something cold in it, right? So watch. All that venous blood from the metabolically active parts of your body. What is this? What's a TED Talk? Oh, we ain't got time for no TED Talks. We got to learn about oxyhemoglobin. Who's with me, guys? So watch, all that venous blood from the warm parts of the body, metabolically active parts, are going to mix 
with the cooler blood from the relatively non-metabolically active parts. Ain't that right? So what's going to happen to the temperature of that blood when it gets into the right side of the heart? Will it be warmer or colder? Colder. colder. Say yes. And we learned. I'll never forget it. It was a great day. CO2 is an acid. We learned that, didn't we? What do you get rid of in the lungs? Work with me. CO2. CO2. So what's going to happen to the temperature of the blood and the pH of the blood in the pulmonary capillaries? The temperature will go what? Down. Down. And what will happen to the pH? It will go up. And when the pH and temperature, when the pH goes up and the temperature goes down, oxygen has the ability to bind to the iron on hemoglobin. That's how oxygen knows to bind in the lungs and let go when it gets down to the cell. Say, yeah. Watch. Watch. When you got a fever, do you breathe faster or slower? Slow. Think again. Good. Faster. That's because when you have a fever, you have a fever all over. So the temperature of your blood is high in the lungs, so it won't allow as much oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin. So you have to breathe faster and deeper to get more oxygen in. That's why your pulse increases when you have a fever. Because you got to pump more blood to the lungs. Say, so, yeah. You guys didn't like that one? What you should have understood is the importance of understanding at a basic level metabolism. Because metabolism dictates blood flow. It also dictates oxygen delivery to cells. The education of Gateway Techno College students continues. Bless you. How many people got that? I just answered, how does oxygen know to bind in the lungs and let go when it gets down to the cell? Say, yeah. Okay, here we go. Did I spell that right? Here we go. Watch it. The inner lining in the tracheal bronchial tree, the respiratory tract. Remember, I told you, the respiratory tract is what? Is a lot of things. Here we go. The respiratory tract is very vascular, tons of blood vessels, right? Guys. Guys. And the lining of the respiratory tract has two unique features. It has cilia. And what's the function of cilia? To beat, right? And then about every fifth or sixth ciliated cell, you have a goblet cell that secretes what? Mucus. That's a good word. Right? You know what's a good word too? Sputum. Say that. Sputum. Yeah. What is it? Sputum is the stuff that you hack up. Like when somebody spits out a lung cookie, that's sputum. Can I tell you a story about a lung cookie? <laughs> Come on, let me. It's a good one. How many people are getting over the flu? Well, go ahead. Nothing stops <laughs> Latyra. Yeah. Watch. I had a 1986 um, Dodge Dakota 4x4 pickup. The thing was a wreck. You couldn't get in the driver's side. You had to get into the passenger side and slide over, right? It only had one windshield wiper, and it was on the passenger side, so I'd have to drive like this. <laughs> Anyways, I'm coming home from work. Hot day. Foster Avenue in Chicago, right? Guy's coming this way, and he hacks a freaking lung cookie right on my windshield. 
So watch, I was smart. I took the working wiper blade off the passenger side and put it on the driver's side. And I thought, well, no problem, right? I just little little wash and I'll be straight. So I hit the wash thing. No, no <laughs> washer fluid. So I had Googie smeared all over my windshield. Yay! That's a good day. How many people found that? Yeah. You feel good about that? What? Here we go. And you better include this in your answer. That ciliated lining goes all the way from your nose all the way down to your bronchioles. The only place that does not have this mucosal and ciliated lining is the alveoli. Tell me you got that. And the function of that respiratory lining is to prevent bad stuff from getting deep inside your lungs. Say, yeah. And I think I told you this, right? What does smoking do to cilia? Right. The other thing that smoking does, and I don't think I mentioned that, is it causes hypertrophy of goblet cells. What does hypertrophy mean? Right, hypertrophy means they get bigger. So people who smoke have monster goblet cells. They're huge. And what do goblet cells produce? Mucus. mucus. So they produce a ton of mucus. That's why those smokers have that smoker's cough in the morning. <laughs> right? Really. They start turning red. Yeah. Anybody here smoke? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I hear it all the time. Tim, I quit smoking and I'm coughing more now than I was before. And I'm like, well, you should take up smoking again. <laughs> you know what's good? Um, I got to tell you, Shantix. That stuff works. It does. Gives you weird dreams, though, real vivid dreams. <laughs> tell me you got that. So um, have you heard of a condition called chronic bronchitis? Mm -hmm. Chronic bronchitis is a result of hypertrophy of goblet cells. So these people are just mucus machines. Do you want to be a mucus machine? No. Okay. That's the lining of the respiratory tract. See how easy that was? Okay, ready? What else we got to go over? Asthma, right? And then that should do it. There's a video on asthma too. It's called asthma. It's called the pathophysiology of asthma. Don't look at that though. <laughs> That'll only help you. Okay, here we go. All right, want the whole thing on asthma too. Oh, look at this. Oh, that's cool. Oh, wait. All right, just cool it. I'll, I'll get it together. I had it. And then people start bothering me before class. Desiree. Want this whole thing. There's also a handout on asthma, too. Don't look at that, though. Because it'll help you. <laughs> Got me? Okay, here we go. First of all, write this down. The reason I'm going over this is because um, after we get through the digestive system, I'm going to start uh, talking to you about uh, 
um, the immune system. You got me? All right. So what does the word immune mean? Protection. Right. Immune means protection. Right? So if you catch a case and you're immune from prosecution, what are you? You're protected, right? So the immune system protects. And how it protects initially is by doing what? That's very specific. How does the immune system protect you? What'd you say? No, it protects you by producing inflammation. Inflammation protects you. Say yes. So watch. Asthma and its like is one time the body does stuff that doesn't make sense. An allergy is an exaggerated immune response. The immune system is re overreacting to something that it shouldn't overreact to. Say yes. And people with asthma have allergies. Anyone with asthma has allergies. Do you understand that? And asthma is an allergy in your respiratory tract, specifically the smaller airways of your bronchioles. Say yes. Guys, how many people have ever smashed their toe? Like you think you're walking through a doorway and then you smash your little baby toe. Ow, that thing hurts, man. And you swear. Let me tell you something. Swearing helps. How many people swear when they get hurt? Yeah, it helps, right? Yeah. So swear. Go ahead. Practice right now. Absolutely, but what happens? It gets warm. It gets warm, and then it starts stuff. Robin, work with me. Swell. Say yeah. You need to get this. This is fundamental. You got me? It's fundamental. Watch. When you damage tissue, you release chemicals. These chemicals, one of them is prostaglandins. You like that? How many people like prostaglandins? Nobody? Prostaglandin haters are you, huh? <laughs> the other one is Histamine. How many people like histamine? Nobody likes histamine? You, you, you like it? That's good. Mariah likes histamine. Yeah. I looked on histamine's Facebook. Histamine was talking about Mariah. Yeah, I don't like her either. Are you ready? Watch. You better get this. <laughs> Prostaglandins and histamines do a couple of things. One big thing they do is cause massive arterial vasodilation. Huh? How many people followed that? Massive arterial vasodilation. Watch. If it dilates the arteries, when the little left ventricle contracts, where is it going to be sending more oxygenated, red, warm blood? 
to that site. That's why when you injure a part of your body, it becomes red and warm. <laughs> you don't think that's good? No? You're not happy about that at all? Did you follow that? Watch. 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 You have little pain receptors all over your body. We're going to do this in a lab. Each one of you is going to take your hand, put it on the lab table, and I'm going to hit it with a hammer. <laughs> Watch. Prostaglandins stimulate these little receptors called nociceptors. That's a good word, too. A lot of good words in the immune system. Nociceptors. Who's with me? No. What does noxious mean? Wild. Yeah, these are wild receptors. <laughs> Right, stinks. It's painful. Tell me you got that. Noxious is painful. What stimulates these noci receptors? Just follow the arrow and read it. There you go. So watch. What causes inflammation? One of the things. Prostaglandins. What produces pain? You'll never guess, and if you guess, I will, I can't even, uh, I'll just be, bam, boom, blown away. What do you think ibuprofen, naprosyn, what do you think they inhibit the formation of? Prostaglandins. That's why... Ibuprofen, Tylenol, not Tylenol, but Ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory and an analgesic. Okay, so, so the, nox, the Noxy receptors cause the pain or the prostaglandins? Prostaglandins stimulate the nox, uh, Noxy receptors, and that causes pain. Okay. I was just telling you about this. What? Are you perfect? Are you perfect? It's not a perfect response. So what you want to do is you want to, elim you want to limit the inflammation to the area of damage. Sometimes everybody hurts. So by taking that, you're limiting the inflammatory response to the damaged area. I'll explain that later. I will. When we get to, did you follow this? All I wanted you to get out of this is that the immune system's job is to protect you, and it protects you by producing inflammation. How do you get inflammation? Forget all this. How do you get infl Look at this. By, the by massive arterial vasodilation. Say yes. Did I not tell you? And I will never forget it. It was a Friday. I told you that the respiratory tract is very vascular. Did I not tell you that? Here we go. Write this down. Just draw this arrow any place. Just draw it. The bronchioles are primarily made of what? Muscle. What are the two things that muscle can do? There you go. I'm going to explain this. And I'm going to do it in one breath. I'm not even going to breathe. Ready? Hang on. 
asthma is a allergy that occurs in your respiratory tract, primarily your bronchioles. The lining of the of the respiratory tract, including the bronchioles, is very vascular. So what we're looking at here is alveoli, and then those little tubes are bronchioles. What are the bronchioles mostly made out of? Muscle. Muscle. So watch. How many people here are allergic to cats? Yeah. So if you are allergic to cats and you see a cat, have you ever seen a cat? Raise your hand. Anyways, a cat comes by me and I go, hey, here, Kitty K. And I pet the cat. And when you pet the cat, cat hairballs go flying in the air. And you suck in a cat hairball. We're making it black because it's evil. <laughs> Are you with me? Because you're allergic. To cats, you're going to get an exaggerated immune response, are you not? And it's because it's in the lungs, what's going to happen to the lining of the bronchioles? It's going to what? It's going to do something. We've got a lot of comments out there. All the blood vessels within all oh, you no good all the blood vessels within the lining of the bronchioles are going to dilate say yes so what's going to happen to the size of the hole that the air can get through it's going to get smaller so what's going to happen to resistance to airflow it goes up. Is this tense? To airflow increases. If you get this, airflow increases. You with me? Guys? But the hallmark of asthma is this. The muscular walls of the bronchioles will contract and that will further make those bronchial holes smaller. Who's following me? So resistance to airflow goes up even more. So that, uh, creates that, that creates the wheezing sound. How many people wheeze? How many people want to wheeze? You want to wheeze? No. I want to go to Gateway. So observe. Cat hair ball. Here, kitty, kitty, inflammatory response, increased mucus production, and watch it, watch it, bronchospasm. Here it comes. Here it comes. Bam. Squeezing that mucus ball out. Are you with me? And anything that flows has to follow Ohm's flow law. Ain't that right? Yes, Timmy, that's right. Which is air Airflow is airway pressure divided by resistance to airflow. If resistance to airflow goes up, what has to happen to airway pressure? What? It has to go up. And the, to increase airway pressure, you have to increase the volume of your lungs. That's why people with asthma, they're like, because <gasps> they're trying to overcome that resistance that was caused by that allergic reaction to that dirty, nasty cat hair ball. Tell me. You got that. Yes or no? Do you want your bronchial muscles to constrict? No, you don't. You better write this down, better not pout. In your lungs, specifically the bronchioles, you have receptors, oh no, called beta 2 receptors. What binds to beta receptors? Epinephrine. Say yeah. 
So when someone has asthma, should you give them a shot of epinephrine? Yeah, it's going to do everything in the body. Where's your problem? In your lungs. So you want to deliver a medicine that mimics epinephrine, but only to the lungs. And that medicine is albuterol. You ever hear of albuterol? So watch. This is what you do. Shake it up. <laughs> right? Then you heat it. And then you suck it in. And then you go, here. <laughs> are, you, are you with me? So watch. What it's going to do, what does epinephrine do to blood vessels? Please get this right. That's very good. You said that with confidence, too. What was the problem? The blood vessels and the lining dilated. So when you take albuterol, it's going to cause the blood vessels in the lining to constrict. Say yes. And you got these little beta-2 receptors. And when a drug that mimics epinephrine binds to a beta-2 receptor, it causes the muscle to relax and opens up the airway. Yay! Whee! Did you follow that? Watch. Anybody ever take an albuterol inhaler? How do you feel after you take an albuterol inhaler? You feel jacked up because you are on a drug that mimics epinephrine, the fight or flight hormone. That's why parents, when they have kids with asthma, they say, okay, Joey, time for your nebulizer at 9 o'clock. And then you hear him bouncing off the walls, right? Because he's jacked up on a drug that mimics epinephrine. Do you follow that? There was a drug back in my day that they used to give the kids called theophylline. And the therapeutic dose and the toxic dose are really close. And these kids would come in in theophylline toxicity, literally bouncing off the walls. They would run and run into the wall, bounce off of it, and bounce. I'm not even kidding. One kid sat there and hit his head against the wall. Not even playing. That's bad. Tell me you followed that. Now watch. Think about this. Think about it for a minute. When you're scared, what does epinephrine do to all of your blood vessels? What does epinephrine do to your bronchioles? Do you want your bronchioles to constrict when you ha are about to run or fight for your life? So some dude's going to, right, comes up to you and robs you, and he wants your textbook, and you're like, here, dude, here, here I'll give you money to take it off my hands. So he's going to rob your Facebook, right? I have a question. So if somebody has like, severe asthma, do they have to take that in the butyrol? Is that, I don't know if that's all right. Is that like, as, as a preventative measure or like no. reactionary? No, it's reactionary. It's called a rescue medicine, okay. right? And I, I'm going to explain this. Now watch. So it would only make sense that when epinephrine binds the beta-2 receptors, it's going to cause the bronchioles to get bigger. Because when you're running or fighting for your life, do you have to get more air in and out of your lungs? Do you? Yes. So the body's preparing to run or fight for your life. That's why these drugs mimic epinephrine. Do you see this? Okay. Now watch. This is what's referred to albuterol and the like are referred to as rescue medicines. If you're, <laughs> you take albuterol. Tell me you got that. What caused, what caused this problem? What's an allergic reaction? It's an exaggerated immune response. Say yeah. What suppresses your immune system. Sure.
steroids do it. Tell me you got that. Now watch, this is really important. It's really important. Anybody got a kid with asthma? Right? How many times did you have to bring him to the emergency room? Do you have to bring him to the emergency room? So what they will do is they will give, put him in an albuterol mask, and then they will give you, they will either give him IV steroids, and then give you a what's called a med dose pack. You've heard of prednisone? Prednisone is a strong oral steroid. Say yes. And it suppresses the immune system. And what does the immune system cause? My name is? What does it cause? Inflammation. What's, what caused the problem? Exaggerated immune response. So steroids suppress the immune system, so they suppress inflammation. Listen up, because this is true. And now you've been educated. Most kids now should not be going to the emergency room for repeated exacerbations of their asthma. Boy, that sounded like a public service announcement. Hi, I'm Timmy. <laughs> so watch. If they give you a steroid inhaler, it takes about three to four weeks of daily steroid inhaled steroids to adequately suppress the immune system. Hold up. So what happens is a kid goes in the emergency room and he had a bad day. Get the albuterol treatment, right? Little solumedrol, then a little med dose pack, and he's good. So he starts breathing good. You follow? And then, because he's breathing good, not using as albuterol, they don't get the steroid inhaler every day. That's the mistake. If your kid comes to you and says, Mom, I'm a breathing mother. I ain't never breathed better in my life. Take the steroid inhaler, and you take it every day. And that will prevent those kids from having to go to the emergency room. That's a fact. Say, so, yeah. All right, real quick. This doesn't have to be included in your answer. Just continuing education. There's a drug called, or a uh, chemical called leukotrienes. Leukotrienes are released from white blood cells, and they cause the muscle, the muscle, spasm. the muscle spasms. So there's a drug out there called Singular. Have you ever heard of it? Singular prevents the release of these leukotrienes. That's another drug used to treat asthma. Tell me you got that. All right, watch. You're gonna be. How many people are gonna be nurses in here? Right. So you got a whole boatload of them. Which which inhaler do you tell the person to take first? The albuterol or the steroid? Watch, if they're having a bad day, you take the albuterol first because you want to open up the airway. If the airway is closed, the steroid won't be able to get in there and it won't do any good. What's the function of the steroid in asthma? Suppress the immune system. So when little kids are taking steroid inhalers, they're always told to rinse out their mouth afterwards. Because if you take the steroid inhaler and it hits the back of your throat, it will suppress the immune system in the back of your throat, and you'll get a fungal infection called thrush. That's why they tell you to rinse your mouth out. The education of Desiree Owens continues. How many people got that? You had a question? Did I answer it? I had a question. So my son, he takes the one that you put over your face. Does that, does that do the same thing? Exact same thing. It's better because it nebulizes it already. Most people, number one, don't know how to uh, smoke a crack pipe, and they don't know how to take an inhaler. When you take the inhaler, you shouldn't be putting it in your mouth like you're sucking on a crack pipe, right? You should hold it away from your mouth a little bit, maybe three or four inches, and let it nebulize, and then suck it in. And hold it in for about 10 seconds. Just don't go... <laughs> Say, yeah. So when they make those, uh, 
The spacers, yes. For people who don't know how to do it, so when you hit it, it will nebulize, then you suck it in. Those things are expensive, though. Huh? <laughs> Nebulizes like to get it into the air where it kind of mists. Yeah, they call it a nebula or something like that. Yeah. Nebulous is like uh, transparent gossamer. Say yes, that's asthma. The number one de uh, cause of death in um, kids uh, under the age of eight is a condition called status asthmaticus. Sounds like a game by Ronco. Hey, let's play status asthmaticus. Um, it's where the asthma is so bad that the airways constrict so much that they can't move any air. And if they are not close to medical treatment, those kids end up dying. It depends. Uh, for what? Like with the status at Maticus? No, not with that, with like regular asthma. If they're having an attack. They should be sucking on their inhaler. If you don't have an inhaler, then you drink coffee. I'm saying when they're having an attack? Yeah. So they don't, they don't have to go to the emergency room right away? What, who? A kid or an adult? A kid, you always take them to the emergency room because they ain't going to be able to tell you how, you how they feel. And how you can tell if they're having a bad day is you look at the muscles, in, the intercostal muscles. And if you see when they're breathing that they're retracting, you can see the space between the ribs, you get their fatty acid to the emergency room. They're in trouble. Say, so, yeah. As an adult, I can't breathe. I better get my fatty acid to the emergency room. Right? Or if you want to read the textbook, uh, look, I'll have to just, you know, work through this. What's that? How does coffee heal? Uh, coffee, when it's metabolized, the caffeine is metabolized to a chemical called xanthine. And xanthine's a bronchodilator. Wow. What age is asthma generally presented to? Um, they usually don't test for it until after the age of four or five. It, no, it can present earlier, but they really don't uh, uh, diagnose it. And uh, they'll still treat it regardless, but they don't diagnose it until typically after four, four or five. And kids can't do a pulmonary function test to really do it. Adults can barely do it. So uh, doctors treat it empirically based on what they see and what the family's telling them, and then they'll treat it that way. But this is bad stuff. If you ever had an asthma attack for whatever reason, not being able to breathe, that's the worst feeling in the world outside of not reading in the textbook. Say yeah. Any questions? I have one more question. Yeah, you're loaded today, Mariah. I don't know if this is like, true or not, but like, do some people only like the asthma happens when they get sick? Yes. Yes. So yes. Um, don't know. I, I don't know. So it's just harder to breathe when they get sick? Yeah. I don't know. I kind of do, but, it, like, if you say after class, I'll explain it. It gets a little involved. Is that okay? You want to stay after class? I don't want to go on. Take my pathophysiology class. I'll tell you all about it. Yeah. Make me some money. Yeah, that's probably, yeah, yeah, do you feel dizzy and lightheaded? I've actually fainted from it. Yeah, that may be, uh, that may be uh, close to anaphylaxis. That may be close to anaphylactic shock. Yeah, so that's anaphylactic. <coughs> Asthma shouldn't affect your throat. If it feels like your throat's closing off, that's a total body allergic reaction. That's bad for you. Yeah. I know some perfumes, man. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and some perfumes are worse than others. The cheap stuff is much worse. I used to work with this guy who wore who wore polo to work at a construction site. I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? And it was like it would leave puddles wherever you worked. Like you couldn't get rid of that stuff. I'm like, cut it out.
I don't like perfume. I'm going to come out with my own perfume. You know what it's called? Scent of a decaying carcass. <laughs> Scent of a decaying carcass. Okay, <laughs> that's respiratory. Say yeah. Guys, did I answer all the questions? Did I, yes or no? Well, I don't have to take the quiz. You do. Did you answer 11? What's 11? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you were sleeping. Didn't I lick the paper? Did I lick the paper? Yeah. You haven't. Yeah, you better. That's going to be on there. I like that question. Is there audio in the last video? The what? No, there isn't. What I'm going to do is I'm going to redub it. Yeah. Going to redub it in English. Yeah. High fidelity. Benina. What's 13? Don't worry about that. You're going to do that on the final. Take that off. Don't worry about it. Put an X through it right now. Everyone. What's this? It's PCO2. In here? Yep. Number two. Okay. Um, we're officially done with respiratory. <coughs> <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Um, you know what I'll do? Um, I'll look for a, a video on um, from a previous uh, semester that explains that, and I'll post it. You got me? Yes or no? Guys? Okay. Turn in your multiple guests, and then take a break, and then we're going to start digestion. We've got to go through that stuff. recommended him for the billboard they wanted me but I told them that I have a face for radio well, he recommended, he recommended you for me. well you know he clearly does not like you <laughs> what Are you recording this for sure? yeah Joey we're way ahead of you I'm <laughs> recording I've checked audio no, but it's, it's yeah look okay. hey you guys are very anal retentive about that, right? You're very obsessive. Knock it off. Okay, here we go. Digestion is something you can relate to. You do it every day. You breathe every day, too. You should be able to relate to that. How many people breathe every day? Here we go. Watch. Watch. What does epinephrine do to metabolism? It speeds it up. What's a byproduct of metabolism? Heat, right? So when you come in here, that seed is going to be warm. That's why they call it the hot seed. No? Okay. Oh, boy. Oh, wrong one. Okay. Write this down. Write this down. I'm not. You are writing it down. The digestive tract is a hole through your body. Do you understand that? Listen up, because this is true. If you were to rip out somebody's digestive tract, 
straighten it out. You could look through it. Unless, of course, there was a big turd in the way. <laughs> that's why it's called that's why it's called the elementary canal. It is an actual tunnel through your entire body. Say yes. And listen up because this is true. Anything, any organ that secretes into the digestive tract any organ that secretes into the digestive tract is called an exocrine gland. Tell me you got that. Listen up because this is true. Any organ any organ that secretes into the blood is an endocrine gland. So the pancreas secretes insulin and glucagon into the blood. So is the pancreas an endocrine gland? Yep. The pancreas also releases digestive enzymes into the digestive tract. So is it an exocrine gland? Yes. So the pancreas is a dual gland. Say yeah. Have you heard of medicines like Trulicity? Have you heard of that? Genuvia. Have you heard of these medicines? I'm going to explain to you how they work. Isn't that exciting? I can see. Oh, no. Gretchen, she's like, oh. Easy, okay, look. Okay, watch. The digestive tract is basically a hollow muscular tube. What are the two things that muscle could do? There you go. So, do you want the muscular walls of the digestive tract? to randomly contract and relax. No, you don't. You want them to rhythmically and systematically contract. And the process of the digestive system muscles rhythmically and... What was the other word I used? <laughs> systematically contract is called peristalsis. You've heard of this. So food moves through your digestive tract in peristaltic waves due to the contraction of the muscular walls of the GI tract. Tell me you got that. Who's following this? A little bit? Okay, write this down. Write this down. Each distinct section of the GI tract each distinct section of the GI tract is separated by a circular band of muscle. A circular band of muscle has a name. Do you know what it is? It's called a sphincter. Say that. Sphincter. Just walk around saying it. Sphincter. What's that? A circular band of muscle that separates distinct portions of the GI tract is called a sphincter. Say, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is the esophagus separate from the stomach? Yes. Good. Otherwise, it would be called the esophagus stomach. So is there a circular band of muscle that separates the esophagus from the stomach? Yes. Is there a, is the small, are the small intestines separate from the stomach? So is there a circular band? Yeah. Say, tell me you got this. Okay? All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, go, going to give you an overview of the digestive system, right? And then I'm going to ask you a few questions about, uh, you know, like calories and things like that. Say, yeah? All right? And we're going to move from there. All right? First of all, What's the difference? What's the difference between diet and nutrition? <laughs> right, if you diet, you die. 
Diet is what you eat. What you get out of what you eat. Now watch. Is beer nutritious? So what I do is I take a black Sharpie when it says 0 0.4 grams of protein and I X it out and put 20. Did I tell you what my, uh, my brother-in-law's father used to do? He's a, like a pack rat, right? So he would go to like this, mat, when there would be a sale on mayonnaise, he would buy like 96 jars, right? And then he would store the stuff down in his basement. So would he have an expiration date on it? Let's say February 25th. Well, he would look at it, and then he would take a black Sharpie and put June 25th. So I think he believed that by actually changing the expiration date, it would actually change when it expired. That's what they believe at Pink and Safe. <laughs> I like that. Um, I like that boss sandwich, man. I picked up one last night. I got up twice in the middle of the night. <laughs> Opened up my fridge, got me a knife, hacked off a hunk, right? And then you know what I did? I ate it in my bed. Then I woke up and I had like pieces of like lettuce all over my bed. <laughs> you guys don't eat in bed. You don't eat like a meal or something? No, oh, you need to do that. Yeah. My girl gets so mad. Yeah, they're always selling bad stuff. I don't care. If it's cheap, I'll eat it. You got to die of something, right, Desiree? Yeah, they said, like, when you go to the grocery store, make sure you check the temperature in there. And, like, the, the freezer to make sure it's right, because, ugh. Yeah. Like, no. It's not. I always die of the old babies. Like, it's 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 Right, it's your ideal body weight times 10. Yeah. My ideal body weight is 110. Same. <laughs> so if I multiply that by 10, I should take in about 1,100 calories. That's my basal metabolic rate. You got me? Now, watch, watch. No What's that? No ever. How much is a, like a, one of those like burritos? So what? You gotta. Die. You know what? Don't eat for a week, and then you can have three of them. <laughs> right? You know what? Here's the weird thing about people. Very few people eat because they're hungry. People do. You know, one of the reasons, the biggest reason people eat is they're tired. Oh yeah. They're tired. Right? And if you just could take like a power nap, a 20-minute power nap, you'd wake up and you wouldn't be hungry. The other thing is, people eat when they're stressed. Right? They had that stress eating, right? Or people eat when they're bored, right? Now watch. I can solve that. Read the textbook. You won't be bored. Everybody, you know, everybody's got an attitude, huh? What? What did you say up there? 110. That's my ideal body weight. Times 10? Yeah. Where where were you just now? Huh? that wasn't in other stuff I learned. So do you like work out? Whatever I say is right. Yeah, yeah. Boy, you're explaining it really good. You should be a teacher. Yeah.
<laughs> um, watch. The only way you can accurately measure someone's percent body fat is to cut them up and separate the fat from everything else. Do you understand that? Do you know how BMI or the bio, bioelectrical impedance, when they, you stand on a little machine and it gives you a percent body fat? Fat does not conduct electricity. Fat is anhydrous, doesn't have a lot of water. You follow? So if your tubby, when they send that electrical current through you, you're not going to have a lot of current come down on your foot, or your other foot. So the more resistance you have, the more fat they calculate it to be. But if you're dehydrated, then your body fat goes up. So like, what about when they pinch the fat? No, that's based off uh, seven dead white guys. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm lying, you can look it up. They took seven dead white guys, cut them up, and determined, used the caliper measurements to determine percent body fat. Percent body fat is meaningless. Do you understand that? What you do is you get a full length mirror at Kmart for 10 bucks, take all your clothes off, look in it, and if you like what you see, you're good. If not, then eat less and exercise more. Boom. End of story. And just so you know, as you get older, you eat less. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be, yeah. Hmm. Walking sideways through doors, huh? I can't eat that much food, man. You know what I mean? Especially if I'm drinking. If I'm drinking, I ain't eating. Because if I start getting full, then I can't drink anymore. And what's more important? <laughs> them Duke boys. That's right. That's right. Tell me you got that, guys. And, you know, they have all these averages of, like, you, it should be 20% carbs, you know, 30% fat and 50% pro Look, watch. God gave you a pancreas that secretes insulin for a reason, right? You're supposed to eat carbs. You're supposed to eat amino acids, protein. You're supposed to eat fat. And fat makes food taste good. You got me? Right? So the more fat content a food has, the better it tastes. Right? I mean, for real. And as you get older, right, when I was a kid, not obviously not now. That's why you see tubby kids. Right? My parents didn't drive me anywhere. If I wanted to go someplace, I had to get on my bike or t walk my fatty acid there. Right? And we were always outside running around. You don't see kids running around anymore. You don't. The neighborhood was bad. There was some parent tried to send their 10 year olds to run, run around and play two blocks away from their house. And they got arrested for that. Yeah. Because they didn't want to go play. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And people don't do it. And they don't. And that's what's going to kill people. And not reading the textbook. Say, yeah. How many calories you burn if you run a mile? How many? How many calories do you burn if you run a mile? That's not true. No. Mm. 400? Damn, I'd, I'd be running all the time. Have me a big pizza. It's 100. So watch. You run three miles, then you stop at a 7-Eleven and get a Snickers, you just blew that workout. So the only way to really, really, if you want to lose weight, is put less food into your mouth. That's what it comes down to, right? And again, when people, I, I got these people that work, Tim, make me have a diet so I can lose some weight. I'm like, are you retarded? Are you? Like, are you retarded? You can't read? I said, I don't know what you like. Go online. All you got to do is put in your likes and how many calories you want, and they'll spit it out for you. You're looking for an excuse not to do anything. When people are motivated and they want to lose weight, they find a way. Right? But smart people take advantage of people's weaknesses. Get the Joey Buttafuoco, right? A dominizer, right? Yeah, you do this and you'll have a flat stomach in a week. <laughs> Can you do uh, sit ups and get a flat stomach? No. Why not? Wait a minute. <laughs> if you got that flabby skin in your triceps, you got fatty triceps, right? Where the skin's kind of hanging and you could put like a little piece of, right? You could put like a, some gum on there and kill flies with it. It's like, bing! <laughs> Are you following? If you do, if you work out, that will lose, it, that, will lose that fat there, right? You'll lose the fat there. Yeah. Right, so you can spot reduce. Right, I got a fatty tricep, so I'm gonna be doing these all day. <laughs> that will. <laughs> what? When a nice cube melts, where does it melt? All over. So when you use lose weight fat, you lose fat all over, and then. The lovely people. Well, the first fat on is the last fat off. That's because there's more of it. And it takes longer. You can't spot reduce. Do you understand that? Fat, you lose fat like an ice cube melts all over. And the only way to do that is get off your fatty ass and move and eat less. Bam. Does weight trainers work? What? Does weight trainers work? No. All waves trainers do. Oh God! No, no, that's ridiculous. All it does is squish your guts and re reorient your guts. That's all it does. Yes, it's a good yes. Right. You know what? Next time you're going to buy something stupid like that, just give me 50 bucks and I'll save you 50. <laughs> Guys, listen, listen. Watch, 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 watch. If those things really worked, do you know what a big company would do? They would say, hey, dude who invented this, we're going to give you a boatload of money here. And then we're going to buy it from you, and then we're going to make sure that a doctor has to write a prescription for it. That's how they make their money. Do you think all these pills, hey, it takes Diamond X Blue, right? I used to be Tubby and not read the textbook. Well, I took Dynamax Blue and... <laughs> and you don't think if those things really work, that a Pfizer or a Bristol Myers would say, hey, we're going to buy that from you. Come on. If it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Yes? Why do people take Adderall as diuretics? 
as a diuretic? Adderall makes you pee more? Sorry, as a, like, to be Adderall is uh, epinephrine. It doesn't give you more energy. All it does is speed up your metabolism. You are, you're on, you're high. Do you understand? Right? Do you know how Adderall works? Did I explain it to you? Watch. Adderall increases neural activity. People with ADD need Brain, their brain to be stimulated. So what are they doing? They're pretending to read the text, but they're like, oh, a squirrel, right? Because <laughs> they need that. What Adderall does is increases neural activity so you already have the increased neural stimulation so you can focus. That's basically how it works. But don't they say like, it's bad for kids? Like, it's bad for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, it's epinephrine. That's what it is. That's why people who are on that are like, <laughs> right? They're they're high on a. That's it's meth, right? It's epinephrine. So you lose weight, and if you're on Adderall, doctors will monitor your weight because watch when you're writing or fighting for your life. Are you worried? Dang, I'm, I haven't eaten since seven a.m. So. It's going to suppress your appetite. That's why they monitor your weight and you lose weight. Because it suppresses your appetite and increases your metabolism. That's why. But don't take it. Best thing to do, read the textbook. Right. That was like, you know what, I think you guys have a, what do they call that? A force field up. Any time I say textbook, it's like an invisible force field. And all those words just bounce right off of it and go directly into that garbage can. <laughs> say, yeah, you're following this. Okay, here we go. I'm going to take you on a little, uh, uh, a little journey through your digestive tract. Yeah? Watch. Digestion occurs, begins in the mouth. And digestion begins two ways. Chemically, through the release of saliva. And saliva contains an enzyme called amylase. And amylase begins the digestion of carbs. So where does digestion begin? in the mouth with the release of saliva. And saliva contains the enzyme amylase and begins the digestion of carbs. The other way is mechanical and through chewing. Right? What's the medical term for chewing? Mastication, right? My mom told me I'd go blind if I did that. What? <laughs> Don't be using that word. <laughs> Tell me you got that. Guys? Okay, watch. As people age, they get into their 70s and 80s, they lose weight. And they lose weight for a couple of reasons. Number one, they ain't got no tephases anymore. And listen up, because this is true. One of the most enjoyable parts of eating is the act of chewing food. You got me? So if you ain't, don't have any teeth, you can't chew food. Would you like a pureed steak? The thought of that makes you want to vomit. You got me? So, and one of the ways that you have, one of the ways you taste food is that it has to get dissolved in solution. What dissolves your food? Saliva. And as you age, you produce less saliva. So they can't dissolve the food because they don't produce a lot of saliva, so they can't taste it. So their desire to eat decreases. Plus, they have a hard time chewing. And any teeth that they do have left, it's going to hurt for them to chew. That's why they tend to lose weight. Right? 
That's why you get, people get old people breath. You know what I'm talking about, right? And then they get the little crusty stuff around there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got to start. <laughs> um, and that's why their, their um, breath is bad, too. And I like this. <laughs> like these people are kind of out of it, you know, guys or women in nursing homes. Yeah, ethylate the whole plate, right? And then you go change her dentures, and she's got like nine meals stuck to the roof of her dentures, you know? You ever see that? Yeah. Could feed a small village. <laughs> so, watch. On your tongue, there are five tastes you can taste on your tongue. What are they? Sour, sweet, salty. Sour, bitter. sweet. Bitter, salty, yeah, and uh, the new one they found is, um, yeah, it's you, mommy, you mommy, you mommy, yeah. So somebody said that to me, and I said, oh yeah, you daddy, <laughs> you greasy, greasy granny. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm kind of making that up. You're going to have to Google that one. <laughs> that was a big thing back when I was a kid. You talk about somebody's mama. Ooh. You talk about somebody's daddy's leg and just go all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> what? I don't know how to spell it. Look it up. Anyone know how to spell it? U -M -A -M -I. Nice. U A what? U M A M I. That would be a good name. Yeah, your mommy. Your mommy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that was number six. How you spell it again? M A M I? Mm -hmm. Oh, I was close. Wait, why does it say number six? Oh, number five. <laughs> like to pick, don't you? Okay. Why is that? Savory. Savory. Yeah. Like some things are like, you know, like really, really good. You know? Like Hot Pockets. Yeah, you loving on some Hot Pockets. Yeah. You know what I had? Uh, Wells Brothers Pizza? That stuff's good. Yeah, it's really good. That was the first time in my life I had that. Then I had Gino's East Pizza from downtown Chicago. That crust is so good. Love that crust. Say yeah. Okay, watch. Watch. You know what mumps are? Mumps. You've heard of measles, mumps, and rubella? Do you know what mumps are? I don't know. I'm asking. Do you know what it is? Mumps. Forget it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a virus that infects salivary glands. That's why you get the mumpy look. Fine. I don't care. You better know the different salivary glands and their location. The biggest one are your parotid glands. They secrete mucus along with this watery saliva. The purpose of the mucus is to coat the food so it slides down your esophagus. Mm -mm. That's why when you spit, the the lung cookie stays together. That mucus in your mouth. Tui. Tui. Say yeah. Then you have the, um, I told you parotid. Then you have the, the uh, sublingual. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm sorry. And then, yeah, submandibular and sublingual. You got me? And they just secrete a um, liquid saliva. You following? Yep. The parotids secrete the mucus containing saliva. Yes, the parotid only have the mucus. Zayaba. All right. Now, where do you want the food to go? Okay, where do you want it to go before that? You want it to go down the esophagus. So what's the little flap of cartilage that protects the trachea? The epiglottis closes when you swallow the food and it goes down the esophagus. Now, what's the esophagus made out of? Muscle. So you want to rhythmically contract that muscular wall of the esophagus to propel it towards the stomach. And what's it called when the muscular walls of the GI tract rhythmically contract? Peristalsis. And you want peristalsis to go from the mouth to the toilet, not the other way around. Say, so, yeah. Okay. All right. Now watch. Watch. What's the dome-shaped muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity? The diaphragm. Now watch. Where's the esophagus? In the mediastinum or the thoracic cavity. Where's the stomach? In the abdominal cavity. So how does the esophagus connect to the stomach? Well... You better pay attention. Watch. Here's the esophagus. And then the esophagus goes like this. And then it connects to the stomach. So the diaphragm is right here. You got me? The diaphragm? Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. Would that make sense to have this freaking curvy tube like that? Would that make sense? Yes, everything that Right. But it doesn't work that way. <laughs> You've been tricked. <laughs> to connect the esophagus to the stomach. There's a hole in the diaphragm, dear Liza, dear Liza. There's a hole that allows the diaphragm, <laughs> that allows the esophagus to connect to the diaphragm. You with me? That hole in the diaphragm, a hole in a body part, is called a hiatus. If you're on hiatus, you, there's a hole in your schedule. How many people are with me? What's the hole in the diaphragm that allows the esophagus to connect to the stomach? The esophageal hiatus. Have you ever heard of a hiatal hernia? Have you ever heard of it? You've never heard of a hiatal hernia. That's unbelievable. I don't believe you. Yeah, happens. You probably... Wait, wait, wait for it. You just popped one. You got a hiatal hernia. No. <laughs> Mariah's over there uh, farting, huh? Yeah. That's why she, you're going to have to put her in the back next to that fan. <laughs> Are you following? So write this down. A hernia is a part of the body that ain't where it's supposed to be. Do you want your intestines to be sticking out of your abdominal wall? Good. You should write that down. And depending on where it occurs, that will tell you the type of hernia. What's this area called? Inguinal. Inguinal. 
right? So if it pops out here, you have an inguinal hernia. If it pops around your belly button, you have a umbilical hernia. Say yeah. Did I tell you I had an umbilical hernia, or an, an inguinal hernia? Did I tell you about this? And then I had to go in for surgery for it, right? So I got in there really early. I was the first person to have the surgery. And I saw like 10 people that had taken my class. Yeah, that ain't right. Okay, now watch, watch, watch. R write this down. The top part of any hollow muscular organ the top part of any hollow muscular organ is called oh, the, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> what is it that's the pointy Base. part Base. no Base. no Base. no Base. no, Base. no. Base. no. The top part of any hollow muscular organ is called the fundus. How many, how many people have been pregnant here? Right? If you're pregnant, when you go to the OBGYN dude, they will measure from your pubic bone to the top of your uterus. They're measuring fundal height. Because the top part of any hollow muscular organ is called fundus. the fundus. <laughs> Tell me you got that. All right. What's this? The esophagus. What's this? What's the circular band of muscle that separates the esophagus from the stomach called? No, that's the hole. What's the circular band of it, it's gotta end in sphincter? Who said cardiac sphincter? Yeah, that's right. But we it's called the cardiac sphincter. Yeah, because it's near the heart. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Or it is. You can look it up. Or the lower esophageal sphincter, the less. Tell me you're with me. Guys? All right. Lower, lower esophageal sphincter. You're writing that out. You're students. I'm not. Oh, yes. I got degrees. I'm bringing them in. I'm going to show them to you. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to scan them in and put them on Blackboard. So when you go to Blackboard, that's the first thing you say. Timmy degrees. <laughs> See? The lower esophageal sphincter separates the esophagus from the stomach. They're distinct parts. Do you understand? Okay, now watch. Watch. What do you do when you go to bed? God bless Tammy. You say your prayers. <laughs> Write this down. You're going to need to know this. You're going to need to know this. What's the stomach made out of? Muscle. What are the two things a muscle can do? There you go. What's the top part of the stomach called? The fundus. You got me? 
Then you got this little curve right here. What's this little curve called? That's right. Joey, you're killing it. You got your book open, don't you? That a girl. You know, you get here. Plus 20 points on the respiratory. Yeah, right, for having the book and, you know, bringing it. Yeah. Anybody else bring their book? Did you? Yeah, but she, if she had it open and she was answering. What do you think that is? Yeah. What's this? This is the lesser curvature. You got me? Okay, I'm spitballing here, people, hoping for a break. Hang on. Lesser curvature. You can write curvature. What do you think this is? That's the greater curvature. Say, yeah. Now watch. This area here, this area right here, is referred to as the body of the stomach. You got me? And then as you can see, the body of the stomach begins to narrow. And this is called, bad color, Timmy. This area right here is called the pyloric canal. Tell me you got that. Guys? Okay, I'm hoping for something good. All right. Whoops. Here we go. There's a circular band of muscle that separates the pyloric canal from the first part of the small intestines. What is it? The intestine sphincter? Nobody's paying attention to it, Timmy. It hurts my feelings. What? What's the circular band of muscle that separates the pyloric canal from the first part of the small intestines? What? No. It starts with a P. Pyloric sphincter. Say yes. Better write that down. So you got the cardiac sphincter or lower esophageal sphincter that uh, separates the esophagus from the stomach. Then you have the pyloric sphincter that separates the lower part of the stomach, the pyloric canal, from the first part of the small intestines, which is called the duodenum. Not duodenum. It's duodenum. Do you understand that? If I hear you say duodenum, ooh, my mom said duodenum one time. She walks with a limp. Yeah, I tripped her. My own mother. Tell me you got that. Duodenum, that's the only name. This is the pyloric sphincter. Say, so, yeah. Guys, who's following this? All right, watch. The heart, or the heart. <laughs> We're past that, Timmy. The stomach is made of muscle, right? And that muscle is capable of expanding. You got me? So these little folds that you see here, these little ridges here, they're called rugae. These are the folds in the stomach. And these rugae allow the stomach to expand. Tell me you got that. All right. What you, oh, I will throw the left ventricle at you. Right here, I got one. What part of your brain controls hunger, temperature, thirst? What type of tissue is the hypothalamus? Nervous tissue, right? Listen up, because this is true. Connected to the cells that make up the walls of the stomach, you have these nerves called baroreceptors. What do baroreceptors recept? Barrel. 
bear recepts pressure or weight. Tell me you got that. These barrel receptors are connected to the hypothalamus. Who's following me? What did they recept? Pressure, pressure or weight. What happens to the pressure inside your stomach when you eat food? It goes up. As the stomach begins to expand, the pressure increases and it will stimulate barrel receptors and it will tell the hypothalamus, enough's enough. I've had enough. Say yeah. And the longer food stays in your stomach, the longer you feel full. Say yeah. So what happens when you don't feel full? You just keep eating. <laughs> until you have like nacho fries like right here. Like, you go into the mirror, you look, ah, and you see natural fries right in the back of your throat. Mm -hmm. Then you've had enough. Wait, does that really mean that like, you're so cool? Did if you have... Yeah, I think I have, like, heartburn, though. My stuff is, like, just, you know, dumb. What is that? <laughs> 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 yeah, there's some people. So yep. The no, they're in the stomach and they stimulate the hypothalamus to tell you that you're full. There, about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a commercial. There was a lady laying in a bikini on one of those flotation devices. I'm losing weight right now. Right? There was a pill out there that you would take, you would drink it, and when it hit the hydrochloric acid of the stomach, it would turn into a foam and expand the stomach. You got me? Well, problem is one of the ladies was taking it, burped up, and it started expanding in the back of her throat and she died. That's why you don't see that commercial no more. When people die from your product, that's bad for business. So watch. When people are really in trouble, they ha are very, very heavy and they need life threatening, right, life preserving weight loss, they will do what's called a gastric bypass. A gastric bypass is where they take the esophagus, cut it off, and then they take part of the pyloric canal and they connect it to the esophagus and they bypass the stomach. What's that? That's a lot, that's very aggressive. But these people can only eat like, like teaspoons full of food. Yeah. And if you can't eat because you'll get sick, you lose weight. So what happens to the rest of the food? It just sits there. Floats around. Probably doesn't read the textbook either. <laughs> but eventually, doesn't it like, like, you know, it's like expanding or something? What will happen is this little pouch, over time, the body does stuff that makes sense. So you can start re-expanding this pouch, and people, a lot of them, will gain um, back the weight that they had as a result of that, that uh, surgery. It's called bariatric surgery, weight surgery. All right, not a cool. No, no. Tell me you got that. What? No, it was created as a result of the acid. But when you burp up, you burp up hydrochloric acid. That's why it burns when you burp up. You got me? Now, um, watch. Now I forgot what I was going to say, and it was a good one, too. It's all your fault. How did it eliminate? It would be like the, this whole big foamy thing would be in there, block it off their intestines. Look, we, you guys are obsessing on something that no longer exists. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> I was just so I was just telling you. Now watch. You've heard of the lap band? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? The lap band is a laparoscopically induced band that goes around the stomach. You got me? And then there's a little port in there and you inject it with saline. And what that will do is that it will tighten up the band. 
So you can make the band very, very tight so the stomach can't expand very much. So you only put small amounts of food in and because it, the stomach can't expand, barrel receptors are stimulated much sooner. So they lose weight. And then as they begin to lose and get down to their goal weight, then you can unwiden the band or widen the band and then ultimately take it out. But if people's behavior hasn't changed, they're just going to go back to the same weight. That's the way it is. And here's the thing, and I told you this before, right? Is The bottom line is this. Everybody's got their thing. Their thing that kind of grabs a hold of them. And that if it gets out of control, they can't control it. Everyone's got their thing. With people who are, it's food, you can see it. That's the only difference. But don't ever get like holier than thou, like, oh, look at them, right? Uh-uh. Everybody's got it. And if you don't want to admit it, that's fine. I'm here to tell you, I, I know me, right? Everybody's got their thing. And that's just the way it is. So can the band ever break? I don't know. Yeah, it could break up like the Beatles broke up. Remember? <laughs> um, no, that stuff's pretty sturdy. Like, you mean eat enough where it pr produces that? No, the stomach would go before the band went. Yeah. Tell me you um, got that, right? So what's the number one, absolute number one common denominator of all diets? What is included in every diet? Drink water. Because the more water you drink, it will expand the stomach and reduce your appetite, at least temporarily. That's why they tell you, water, water everywhere. Drink water. Drink water until you're coming out of your epiglottis. <laughs> yeah. See? That's why when you go to, like, a Golden Corral, you never drink carbonated beverages, ever. Because that will fill up your stomach, and you can't eat as much. Are you writing that down? That's right. That rotisserie chicken beat a bomb. <laughs> All right, go home, all of you. Leave me alone. What? It can, it can expand, and people are overweight. Their stomach expands. Their resting stomach is like four or five times bigger than the normal stomach. Yeah, so it takes a ton of food for them to feel full.